Hello everyone, this is Praveen Agrawal and in this video we are going to see J-Advanced 2024 Mathematics Paper 1 Detailed Solutions. So the first question is, fx is a continuously differentiable function on the interval open 0 to infinity such that f1 equals to 2 and this given limit is equal to 1. So for each x greater than 0, which of the following is the fx? Now one of the observations is that this is a 0 by 0 indeterminate form. And one of the ways to solve it is using L Hopital rule. So we are going to differentiate both numerator and denominator with respect to this variable t while we are going to treat x as a constant. So if we use the LH rule, okay, my limit will become limit t goes to x. Uh, derivative of t raised to the power 10 will be 10 times t power 9 f of x minus x power 10 as it is derivative of f t will be f dash t f dash of t whole divided by derivative of t power 9 is 9 t power 8 this whole thing is given as so what do we do now is we let t goes to x because now the indeterminacy is removed so this function becomes uh, 10 by 9 times x f x minus uh, again 10 by 9 times x square no minus simply 1 by 9 times minus 1 by 9 times x square f dash x equals to now if we let fx equals to y then f dash x will be dy by dx and you will find that this is a linear differential equation in y and if we rearrange it that is if we multiply by uh, 9 and divide by x square minus x square then it will become dy by dx minus and it will be uh, 9 will get cancelled so 10 by x times y is equals to minus 9 divided by x square so the integrating factor is e raised to the power integral of p dx what is p whatever is multiplied by y integral of minus 10 by x dx it will be e raised to the power minus 10 ln x or x raised to the power minus 10 that is my integrating factor so the solution of the differential equation would be y times x power minus 10 is equals to integral of minus 9 by x square times x power minus 10 dx so this is essentially x power minus 12 on the right hand side whose differential would be integral would be uh, well 9 is already there minus 9 and divide by minus 11 times x power 11 plus so this minus minus will become plus and uh, now to find this constant the initial condition is given as f1 equals to 2 that is at x equals to 1 y equals to 2 if we substitute that in here we will get 2 is equals to 9 by 11 plus c so my c is 22 minus 9 that is 13 by 11. So if I divide by x raised to the power 10 or rather multiply by x raised to the power 10 my y which is fx becomes 9 by 11x plus 13 by 11 times x raised to the power 10. And which option is this? This is my option number B. Alright. Next is a question of probability. A student appears for a quiz consisting of only true false questions and he answers all the questions. The student knows the answers of some questions and guesses the answers of remaining questions. Whenever the student knows the answer of a question, he gives the correct answer and the probability of this happening should be 1. And if the student guesses the answer, the probability of a student giving the correct answer given that he has guessed it is half. So if it randomly marks true or false, then it's a 50% probability, which is logical also of it being correct or incorrect. So in this case, the probability will be half. If he knows the answer, then it being correct versus if he guesses the answer, then it being correct. All right. Also assume that the probability of the answer for a question being guessed, given that the student's answer is correct, is 1 by 6. This probability that he guessed the question provided the, his answer is correct would be. Uh, so in the denominator, let us find out what is the probability of a question getting correct. 
and uh, what is the question let us read the full question then the probability that the student knows the answer of a randomly chosen question is let us suppose this probability is p that the student knows the answer of a randomly chosen question then the probability that he does not know the answer of a randomly chosen question will automatically be 1 minus p so p uh, he guesses and gets the correct answer is 1 by 6 so using conditional probability in the denominator what is the probability of a question being correct there are two cases if he knows the answer whose probability is p he will mark the correct answer with probability 1 or he guesses the answer with probability 1 minus p and then the probability of getting it correct is half and in the numerator what do we want that he guessed it and then got it correct so that is 1 minus p times half and this whole thing is given as 1 by 6 so this is a very simple equation in p which we can solve linear equation so this is 3 minus 3p Is equals to p plus half minus p by two. So three p plus p is four p. Four p minus three. Four p minus p by two is seven p by two, and three minus one by two is five by two. So my value of p is five by seven. Now this is a straightforward question of you can say conditional probability or Bayes theorem. Uh, so from J advanced point of view, it's not that difficult. It's a moderate to easy level question. so answer is option number c 5 by 7 next is uh, we have cot x is equals to minus 5 by root 11 and x lies in the second quadrant so in that case uh, let us first find about out about these expressions let me expand this this is nothing but sin of 11x by 2 sin of 6x now let me pair it up with cos of 11 by Cos cos 11x by 2 cos 6x because this will be the formula of cos of a minus b. Similarly, the remaining terms is minus sine of 11x by 2 cos of 6x and the remaining term from here is cos of 11x by 2 sine of 6x. And if you pair these up, then this is sine of a minus b. So cos of a minus b is cos of 6x minus 11x by 2, and this is sine of 6x minus 11x by 2. So this whole thing is equals to cos of x by 2 plus sine of x by 2. Now, which is the trigonometric ratio using which we can find both of cos of half angle and sine of half angle? That is cos of x. So if we just find cos of x, so if you imagine a right angle triangle whose base is 5 and a perpendicular is root 11, then the hypotenuse will be root of 5 square plus 11 that is root of 36 that is 6 so cos x will be uh, 5 divided by 6 with a minus sign because x lies in the second part and if cos x is minus 5 by 6 how can we find cos of x by 2 and sin x by 2 first of all i can write it as 1 minus 2 sin square x by 2 so my uh, sin square x by 2 will be 1 plus 5 by 6 that is 11 by 12 so my sin of x by 2 will be Now, ideally, it could be plus or minus root of 11 by 12, but because x lies between pi by 2 to pi, my x by 2 will be less than pi by 2, means lie in the first quadrant. So it will be only positive. So let me only take root of 11 by 2 root 3. Similarly, uh, minus 5 by 6, which is cos x, will be equal to 2 cos square x by 2 minus 1. So if we calculate cos of x by 2 from this, it will become 1 by root of 2 root 3. If I substitute these values, this whole thing will be one by two root three plus root eleven by two root three. So this will be root of eleven plus one divided by two root three. Option number B. All right. Next is a question of ellipse and states that consider this ellipse x square by nine plus y square by four equals to one and p of comma q be a point in the first quadrant such that p square by nine plus q square by four is greater than one. This simply means that the point P comma Q lies outside the ellipse. All right. Next is two tangents are drawn from the S to the ellipse, so it is obvious that if a point lies outside the ellipse, then two distinct tangents can be drawn to the ellipse from there. And what has been given about those tangents? Uh, so out of the tangents, one meets the ellipse at one end point of the minor axis. So if I draw the ellipse.
Now we know the endpoints of major axis and minor axis. Let us mark them in the diagram. Uh, it is 3 comma 0 it is uh, 0 comma 2 and one of the tangents is at endpoint of minor axis so this is one of the tangents and this tangent line is of course y equals to 2 and suppose the point p comma q s is here so basically my q will have to be 2 so we want to know what are p and q so q have to be 2 that is there in option number a and option number b so all we have to do is now find the value of p using the given information now let me draw the other tangent as well from s so suppose this is the other tangent let me take this s point a little bit further all right suppose this point is s uh, now another tangent meets ellipse at the point T. So suppose this point is T in the fourth quadrant and let R be the vertex of the ellipse with positive X coordinate. So this point R is R uh, 0 comma sorry 2 uh, 3 comma 0. This point 3 comma 0 is actually my alright. Uh, if the area of the triangle ORT this is my R this is T and this is my origin. If I make this triangle, then its area can be found out using half into base into height. So base is already three units. So height I will find from this area of triangle O R T where O is the origin will be half of three into height is equals to three by two. So my edge is one units. So now we know the y coordinate of point T. Y coordinate of point T will be minus one because this distance is one, but because it is a negative y axis. Uh, it will be minus 1 and if you substitute a uh, y equals to minus 1 in this uh, then what will be the value of x so x square by 9 plus 1 by 4 equals to 1 so 1 minus 1 by 4 will be 3 by 4 so x will be 3 root 3 by 2 positive so the coordinates of t are uh, 3 root 3 by 2 minus 1 all right now uh, all we have to do is find this point s so what i can do is i can find the equation of tangent at this point t in point form how do you write equation of tangent in point form it is t equals to zero that is x times 3 root 3 by 2 by 9 plus y times minus 1 by 4 equals to 1 and uh, where will it cut the line y equals to 2 this line is y equals to 2 so if i put y equals to 2 then x root 3 by 3 to the 6 minus uh, 2 by 4 equals to 1 so this is 1 plus 1 is 3 by 2 x times root 3 by 6 is equals to how much this is uh, 1 plus 1 by 2 that is 3 by 2 so I can cancel this 2 what will remain is 3 and root 3 3 by root 3 is root 3 so x is 3 root 3 root 3 so overall coordinates of s are 3 root 3 comma 2 so my p is 3 root 3 and q is 2 which is option number a all right next is we have been given three sets s t1 and t2 s is all the numbers a plus b root 2 where a and b belong to a set of integers and this root 2 is an irrational number next t1 is all the binomial expansions root to minus 1 power n where n belongs to n and t2 is all the binomial expansions root to plus 1 power n where n belongs to natural number again. So which of the following statements are true? Now from here multiple correct questions start. So more than one can also be correct. Statement A states that Z union T1 union T2 is a subset of S. So let us check for each of these. Is set of integers a subset of S? Yes, it is true because if you just put b equals to 0 right then this whole set will become a where a belongs to integer so it will contain all the integers so this is true but about t1 all the binomial expansions let me do a couple of examples root 2 minus 1 power 1 this is simply root 2 minus 1 is it of type a plus b root 2 where and we are integers yes how about root 2 minus 1 whole square it will be 2 plus 1 minus 2 root 2 or 3 minus 2 root Again of type a plus b root 2, you can find any higher power, you will find that all the higher powers will also be of the form a plus b root 2 where a and b are integers. So yes, t1 is also 
a subset of s as well as t2 again if you expand t2 also any power of n all the terms will look like some integer plus some other integer times root so a statement a is true all right next let us see what is given uh, option number b is uh, t1 intersection 0 to 1 by 1000 2024 equals to 5 so it's a tradition nowadays that if the JE is happening in the year 2024, they will ask a couple of questions in which in the data also they will use the number 2024. This was a common trait in Olympiads and JE they have started it recently. Though this number has no much significance with respect to this question, it's a small number. Now it is saying that there is uh, no element of T such that it has anything common with 0 to 1 by 20, 2024. That is not true. The reason is root to minus 1 is a small number. Uh, smaller than 1 and if you uh, find its higher and higher powers it will get smaller and smaller to the point that as n goes to infinity this will go to 0. So in this interval there will be infinitely many values of t1 basically. So this is clearly not a null set. In fact it will contain infinite it will be an infinite set. So option number b is false. How about option number c? t2's intersection with 2024 to infinity is not a null set. That is also true. Why? Because root 2 plus 1 is greater than 1. So it's higher and higher powers will be uh, be become higher and higher. And as it n goes to infinity, this number will go to infinity also. So if you take the interval from 2024 20, to infinity, this will not be a null set. So this is clearly true. Again, there are infinitely many elements in this set. So the intersection cannot be null set. A is true, B is false, C is true. Let us look at D. For any given A comma B belongs to the set of integers. Cos of this plus eta sign of this belongs to integer if and only if b equals to 0. So finally we are looking at option number d. In exponential form I can write it as e raised to the power eta pi times a uh, plus b root. If you wish you can split it and write it as e raised to the power eta pi a into e raised to the power eta pi b root. And we want this whole number to belong to an integer. So e raised to the power eta a for a belongs to integer will always be integer. e raised to the power eta a, what values will it take? It will be cos k pi plus eta sin k pi. So it will be either 1 or minus 1. It is either 1 or minus 1. So this is integer. The only thing which can make it non-integer is this e raised to the power eta pi b root 2. Because this will be cos of pi b root 2 plus eta sin b root 2. And you will find that if b is an integer and not equals to 0, then it will never be an integer overall. So for this to be an integer, what is this? This is cos of pi b root 2 plus eta sin pi b root 2. Now suppose b was not an integer, then you could put a value of b like 1 by root 2 and then this whole number could become an integer. But because b is an integer, then the only integer which can make this number an integer is when b is equals to 0. So yes, statement number d is true. That if and only if, if a and b are integer, then if only if b equals to 0, then this number will be an integer. This was a slightly good question, especially a couple of parts. Alright. Next is we have been given that S is a triplet of points a, b, c, where a, b, c are real numbers. And a, x square plus 2b, x, y plus c, y square is strictly greater than 0 for all x, y belongs to r square minus 0 comma 0. So this is a quadratic expression in x and y. When will it be always positive? When its discriminant is negative. When its leading coefficient is positive and discriminant is negative. So what is its discriminant? Its discriminant is 4b square minus 4ac is less than 0. So this will give me b square minus ac is less than 0, b square less than ac. So let us see for which of these options uh, is this condition holding. So if we check option number A, B square is 7 by 2 whole square, B square which is equals to 49 by 4 which is 16.25. And what is AC? AC is 6 to the 12. So is 16.25 less than 12? No. So this is not a part of set S. Similarly, let us check option number B. So if it is given that if this point belongs to S, then B square will be less than 3 by 12 
और बी स्क्वायर विल बी लेस देन वन बाई फोर और यू माइट इवन से फोर बी स्क्वायर इज लेस देन वन और इफ यू टेक रूट ऑफ वो साइड यू कैन गेट टू बी होल मॉड विल बी लेस देन वन विच इज माई ऑप्शन नंबर बी विच इज ऑब्वियसली ट्रू ऑप्शन नंबर सी एंड डी ऑल्सो इन्वॉल्व सिस्टम ऑफ लीनियर इक्वेशन ओके so for this system of linear equations to have a unique solution your delta should not be zero so to check option number c let us find delta whether it is zero or non zero so what is delta for c this will be ac minus b square now you know that because b square minus ac is less than zero that ac minus b square will be greater than zero though it was uh, that means that my ac minus b square is not equals to zero that means it will have a unique solution So yes, option number C is also true. What about finally option number D? For any given a, b, c belongs to S, the system of linear equations has a unique solution. So again, two questions will be asked, and they are whether this a plus one times x plus b y equals to zero and b x plus c plus one y equals to zero has a unique solution or not. So this is a homogeneous system of equations, and there are only two possibilities: either uh, it will have infinitely many solution or it will have a unique solution so what will be the condition of infinitely many solutions that will be uh, that the coefficients are proportional that is if a plus 1 by b is equals to b by c plus 1 if you simplify this you'll get ac plus a plus and uh, this is c all right and finally what do we have is uh, ac plus a plus c plus 1 minus uh, equals to b now we have to check whether it is ever zero or not so what are we going to do is we are going to take everything on the left hand side so we have ac minus b square plus a plus c plus 1 now ac minus b square is always positive because b square minus ac is negative so we saw that ac minus b square is positive this is positive number and for this to happen my a needs to be positive and d needs to be negative not only that my c also needs to be positive why suppose it passes to 0 comma 1 right so if you put 0 comma 1 in this you will only be left with c so c must be greater than 0 alternatively if you make it pass to 1 comma 0 then only a will be greater than 0 so both of them are also positive this is positive this is also positive this is also positive and this is also positive so this can never be equals to zero if you put it equals to zero this is uh, not possible because on the left hand side everything is positive so to conclude this will not be zero and if this is not zero that means the system of equations indeed has a unique solution because delta is non zero all right so the correct options are b c and d next question is a good one and a lot of teachers made a mistake in solving the especially the last option d of this question and rightfully so because it is actually a confusing question so first of all let r3 be the three dimensional space and there are two points in it p and q uh, and s and t are two sets s is all the points x such that distance of x from p whole square minus distance of x from q whole square is equal to 50 so let me do one thing let me uh, apply this equation okay we are solving for s and this is x minus 1 the whole square plus y minus 2 the whole square plus z minus 3 whole square this is the distance of p from x minus the whole square and distance of p uh, x from q the whole square would be x minus 4 whole square minus y minus 2 whole square minus Z minus seven whole square, and this whole thing is equals to fifty. So if we simplify this, we will get x square, y square, and z square will get cancelled, and only linear terms of x, y, and z will remain. That means it's the equation of a plane in three. So eight x minus two x is six x, four y minus four y is zero, and fourteen z minus six z is plus eight z. Is equals to 50 plus 16 plus 4 plus 49. These are the terms in the positive, and in the negative we'll have minus 1 minus 4 minus 9. If you simplify this, 49 minus 9 is 40. 40 minus 5 is 35, and 35 plus 
20 uh, is 55 and 50 plus 55 is 105. So 6x plus 8z is equal to 105 is my set S. This is the equation of a plane. Similarly, T is distance of y from q whole square minus distance of y from p whole square equals to 50. Let me apply that. Let me apply for T. So what we'll have is x minus 4 whole square minus y minus 2 whole square sorry plus plus z minus 7 whole square minus x minus 1 whole square plus y minus 2 whole square plus z minus 3 whole square is equal to 1 0 sorry is equals to 50. Now there is a bracket in this. Again x square y square z square will cancel. Uh, here what will remain is minus uh, 6x minus 8z and all the other terms will go on that side so it will become 50 minus 16 minus 4 minus 49 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9. So what will it be is minus 49 plus 9 is how much minus 40 minus 40 plus 5 is minus 35 50 minus 55 is minus 5 and if you multiply with a minus sign then you get 6x plus 8z is equal to plus 500. This is the set. So both of these represents parallel planes. If you draw the diagram, uh, you can see that coefficients of x and y are precise. x, y and z are proportional or the same. So these are parallel planes. Only the constant term is different. Now if you, uh, let us check the options. The option is there is a triangle whose area is 1 and all of whose vertices are from the set S. So yes, you can easily find three points on this plane whose uh, triangle area is 1. So a statement A is very much true. B is there are two distinct points L and M in T such that each point on the line segment LM is also in T. So yes, this will also be true because if you take any two distinct points L and M on T and if you join that line segment, all of those points will also lie on T. So B is also obviously true. Now C is there are infinitely many rectangles of perimeter 48, two of whose vertices are from S and the other two vertices are from T. I think that is true. Now in order to check for C, let us just find the distance between these two parallel planes. Uh, and the, we know the formula is C, D2 minus D1 divided by root of A square plus B square plus C square. So it will be uh, 105 minus 5 divided by root of 6 square plus 8 square. So the distance, this is 100, this is 10, so 100 by 10 is 10. The distance between these parallel planes is 100. Uh, sorry, 10 units. So if I take two points okay, on this plane, uh, such that your distance is 10, uh, sorry, this distance between the planes is 10, this is 10, this is 10. And if you want to have a rectangle of area, sorry, perimeter 48 units, then the sum of remaining two sides will be 28. So each of the following remaining sides will be 14, 14. And you can see that you can make infinitely many rectangles like this, where two points are in S and the two points are in T. So statement C is also true. Finally, statement D is there is a unique square of, sorry, there is a square of perimeter 48. Two of whose vertices are from S and the other two vertices are from T. Now most other teachers mark this option D as false because they assume that uh, if you want to have a square, then all the four sides must be 10. But that is not necessarily true. You need not, uh, suppose we have a square whose perimeter is 8, then what will be the side? Then the side will be 12 units. But uh, some people argued that how is it possible to have a square whose side length is 12 units and two points lie on S and two points lie on T. So you need not have this plane perpendicular to both of the planes. It can be at a slant angle. Suppose this is a side 12 units and then you draw a slightly slant plane which cuts it again. This is also 12, this is also 12, this is also 12. So can you imagine a square like this which is slightly at a slant angle all the four sides are equal the angle between the sides is 90 degrees. Now the problem would occur when the side of the square was less than it that would not have been possible. But here any side greater than uh, the distance between the planes, any side square is possible. So D is also true. So the correct answer is all of these options A, B, C and D.
All right, students. So the next question is based upon simply logarithms. So a is three root two and three x plus two y equals to this. So what is the relation between eighteen and three root two? Eighteen is nothing but the square of three root two. So my first equation becomes three x plus two y equals to log base three root two. Eighteen is three root two, the whole square. And this whole power five by four. Now using laws of exponents, two into five by four will become five by two, and that will come behind the log using properties of log. So the first equation simplifies to three x plus two y is equals to five by two. Similarly, what is the relation between b and this one zero eight zero? So suppose if I imagine the number uh, b is one upon five raised to the power one by six and six power half. If I find one by b, and it will be five raised to the power one by six and six power half. If I want to make it a completely integer, I will have to take power of six. So my one by b raised to the power six is nothing but this is five times six cube, and you will find that five times two hundred sixteen is nothing but thousand eighty. So this whole number is nothing but one by b power six, and there is a square root also. So my second equation actually is. 2x minus y is equals to log base b, and uh, this is b raised to the power minus 6 power half. So this is nothing but minus 3, and if you multiply this whole thing by 2, then you'll have 4x minus 2y is equals to minus 6. Equation number 2. So if I add 1 and 2, I will get 7x is equals to uh, minus of 7 by 2. So x is actually equals to minus of And if x is minus half, if I substitute that in anywhere, my y will become y will be three uh, minus one, that is two. And if I substitute these values of x and y, then my four x plus five pi will become minus two plus ten, that is eight. So the answer to this numerical answer question is simply eight. All right. Next question is. f x is x power four plus a x cube plus b x square plus c. It's a polynomial with real coefficients such that f one equals to minus nine. So let me find f one. F one will be one plus a plus b plus c equals to minus nine. Or you might even say a plus b plus c equals to minus ten. Let me write it as equation number one. Next is iota root three is a root of this equation. So to satisfy this equation. So what I have is four times iota root three whole cube plus three a times iota root three whole square plus two b times iota root three equals to zero. If you do iota root three whole cube, iota cube is minus iota and root three whole cube is three root three. So overall it will become twelve root three with a minus sign iota. Iota square is minus one root three square is three. So overall this is minus nine a and plus this is. 2 root 3 b i t equals to 3. So this is the real part, and overall this is the imaginary part. So if this is 0, then both of them will have to be 0 separately. So 9 a equals to 0 and minus 12 root 3 plus 2 root 3 b is also 0. This will give me a as 0. And what will be the value of b? If you solve for b, b will be equals to 6. A is 0, b is 6. We got the values of a and b. Now they are saying that if alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four are the roots of f x equals to zero. So if I put a and b, and how can I find c? If I substitute d, these values in here, I'll get c as minus ten minus six, which is minus sixteen. So my f x actually becomes a is zero, so x power four, and b is plus six x squared, and c is minus sixteen equals to zero. If I factorize this, its factor will be x square plus eight times x square minus two equals to zero. So either x square equals to minus eight or x square equals to two. This will give me imaginary roots that is x equals to plus minus two root two iota, and this will give me x equals to plus minus root. So these are my four roots. Now what have been asked? We have been asked the sum of squares of their modulus x. So we have 
2 root 2 plus 2 root 2 plus now the are squares the are squares plus root 2 square plus root 2 whole square this is 8 plus 8 16 plus 4 20 so the answer for this question is 20 so this is a mixed question of theory of equation as well as complex numbers all right next one is a question of matrices and determinants and we have to count such matrices so it's more of a question of permutation and combination basically and such questions are pretty common in both GMA and J advanced where functions or matrices chapter is uh, used in conjunction with PNC permutations combinations so uh, in this we have been given that all the elements of this matrix a b c d e belongs to 0 or 1 and determinant of a should either be minus 1 or it should be 1 so let me find determinant of a first Using Sarah's rule of determinant of expansion, it will be 0 into a into a, which is 0, plus 1 into d into 1 is d, plus c into 1 into b is plus bc, minus 1 into a into c is ac, minus b into d into 0 is 0, minus e. So this is simply uh, d plus bc minus ac minus e. Now, determinant of a can either be 1 or it can be minus 1. Now, uh, all of these are arbitrarily symmetric. Now, this is E. Okay. Whatever is the relation between D and BC will be the same as relation between. Uh, what I mean to say is that corresponding to every matrix whose determinant is 1, there will be a matrix whose determinant is minus 1. Because if you interchange D and BC with AC and D, e, uh, the determinant will become minus 1 instead of 1. So, what I can do is I can only count the cases when determinant of A could be 1 and just double that. So exactly same number of cases will be when determinant is minus 1. Now we have to carefully count the number of determinants where uh, the uh, determinant becomes 1. So there are two ways. Let me uh, discuss it in terms of these positive terms and these negative terms. Or we can say non-negative and non-positive terms because all of these belongs to 0 and 1. So using the combinations of 0 and 1, D plus BC can never be negative. So one of the possibilities is that d plus bc becomes 1 and this becomes 0. Another possibility is that d plus bc becomes 2 and ac plus e becomes 1. So corresponding to these, let me write a table of values of a, b, c, d and e. So that d plus bc is 1 and ac plus e is 0. So d plus bc is 1, one of the ways could be d is 0 and bc is 1. So if d is 0 and bc is 1, both b and c will have to be 1. Okay, and now both of these should be 0, so E must be 0, and C is 1, so A also has to be 0. So this is one way when BC is 1. Any other way when BC is 1 and D is 0, well, when BC is 1, D is 0, this is probably the only. Next, let us try to make a D as 1. If D is 1, then BC have to be 0, but that can happen in three ways. What are those three ways? One of them is B is 1, C is 0, another one, B is 0, C is 1, and another of them is all of them are 0. Now corresponding to these cases, let us find the values of A and D. E. Now again we want AC plus E to be 0, so E will have to be 0 in each of these cases again. What about AC? Whenever C is 0, A can be anything. So here A can be 0 or 1, here also A can be 0 or 1. Here if, uh, you know what, C is 1 then A will have to be 0. So we have so far 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 cases. And these are all the cases when uh, D plus BC is 1 and AC plus E is 0. Next, let's consider the case when D plus BC is 2 while AC plus E is 1. In that case, all of these three have to be 1. D also has to be 1, B and C also has to be 1. So middle three numbers are 1. Now, in how many ways can we make AC plus E to be 1? One of them could be that uh, AC is 1 and E is 0. So suppose my E is 0, then both A and C have to be 1. C is already 1, so A can be 1. Alternate is all these three are 1 and E is 1 in that case because uh, C is 1 A will have to be 0. So that's how we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 cases when determinant of A equals to 1 correspondingly 8 cases will be there when determinant of A will be equals to minus 1. What you can do is you can just substitute D with E and B with A. Okay, if you just interchange D with E and B with A, you will get the precise matrices where determinant of A is minus 1. There will be 8 such matrices. 
D becomes E and B becomes A. Yeah. So eight plus eight overall, how many such determinants are there? There are sixty. Now there is a very good chances of missing some of these determinants, so you have to be very very sure before marking your answer. All right. Next is a group of nine students, S1 to S9, are divided to be uh, in three teams X, Y, Z of sizes two, three, four respectively. Now S1 cannot be selected into X and S2 cannot be selected into Y. Then in how many ways can we do this? So to do such questions, we use the principle of inclusion exclusion. What do what do we do is without worrying about these constraints, we found the total number of ways. Out of which we subtract the number of ways in which S1 belongs to X. Minus we subtract all the ways in which x2 belongs to y, but in this process I have subtracted twice the number of ways in which both of them are true simultaneously. So you add it again when s1 goes to x and s2 goes to y. Now total number of ways will be number of ways of dividing nine students into groups of two, three, four. So it will simply be nine factorial by two factorial three factorial four factorial. Another way to fix about it is you choose two people out of nine for putting into x, so nine c two into out of the remaining seven students you choose three for y, so into seven c three, so you'll get the same number again. Minus if s one already goes to x, then how many people remain? One for group one, three for group two, and four for group three. This can be done in eight factorial divided by. One factorial, three factorial, four factorial number of ways. All right. Uh, minus s two goes to y, then two students needs to be selected for first group, two for second group, and four for third group. So this can be done in nine again eight factorial. Divide by two factorial whole square times two factorial times four factorial. But because both of them have two students each, you can again distribute them in two factorial number of ways. So this is uh, nothing but number of ways of dividing s two into three groups of two to four each and giving them to x y z. Finally, uh, both of them happen simultaneously. So one more student needs to be chosen for x, two more for y, and four more for z. This can be done in seven factorial by one factorial two factorial four factorial number of ways. Now in all of these, I can take seven factorial divided by four factorial common. What remains from the first one is nine into eight divided by two into six, minus eight divided by six, minus eight divided by two to the four, and plus one divided by. So if we simplify terms, two four is eight, two two is four, three three is nine. So six remains from the first term. Four by three remains from the second term. Two remains from the third term, and half remains from the fourth term. And this is nothing but seven into six into five. So if I multiply the first term by six, I'll get six fives are thirty, seven threes are twenty-one, and twenty-one into six is zero six. And so what we have is seven into six into five, and into three into two, six fives are thirty. Six threes are eighteen, or seven. Seven threes are twenty-one. Two one zero into six is a large number. Let us see if we are uh, right in calculating all of this. Seven factorial uh, divided by four factorial will be yes. Seven into six into five correct. Nine into eight divided by two into six is also correct. So what we have is. Five twos are ten, and seven threes are twenty-one. Twenty-one into six is one two six zero. Minus this is how much? Three twos are six. Five twos are ten. Seven twos are forty. Three twos are six. Five twos are ten. And seven four is twenty-eight. So minus two eighty. Minus this is two. So five twos are ten, and seven six are forty-two. So minus four twenty, and plus half of this, which is. Uh, one zero five. So overall, we have how much? One three six five minus this is zero eight plus two ten and seven. So what remains is six six five. So total number of phases six hundred and sixty five. 
so this was a slightly uh, good question moderate to moderate side question not that easy not that tough either all right next is a simple question of vectors op is a certain vector so is oq and so is or and op cross oq dot or equals to zero this is nothing but box product of op oq and or this is zero and all of you know that box product can also be denoted with the help of determinant determinant of all of these coefficients let us write all of these coefficients in simplified form this alpha minus 1 by alpha can be written as 1 minus 1 by alpha and 1 and 1 next is 1 1 minus 1 by beta and 1 and finally we have 1 1 and half equals to 0 using properties of determinant let us apply a couple of rows operations so r2 goes to r2 minus r1 and r3 goes to r3 minus r2 so the modified determinant will become 1 minus 1 by alpha 1 1 1 by alpha minus 1 by beta 0 0 1 by beta and minus half and this whole thing is 0 so if I expand this I get 1 minus 1 by alpha times 1 by 2 beta plus 0 and plus 1 by alpha beta and overall we have minus 0 minus 0 minus minus will become plus 1 by 2 alpha equals to 0. So what we have is 1 by 2 beta minus 1 by 2 alpha beta plus 1 by alpha beta plus 1 by 2 alpha equals to 0. If I multiply this whole thing by 2 alpha beta what will I get? I will get alpha minus 1 plus 2 plus beta equals to 0. So we have alpha plus beta plus 1 equals to 0. Now let us read the remaining part of the question. So what are they saying is that the point alpha comma beta comma 2 lies on this plane. So let us make it satisfy this plane. That means my 3 alpha plus 3 beta minus 2 plus L equals to 0. Now from the, this equation I can replace practically alpha plus beta with minus 1 and put it in here. In the next equation. So we have 3 times alpha plus beta. So 3 times minus 1. Minus 2 plus L equals to 0. So minus 3 minus 2 plus L equals to 0. So my value of L will be 5. And this is indeed an easy question of vectors. You just have to apply the scalar triple product formula. Alright, next question is of probability. And the language is slightly complicated. Let us read each and every word slowly carefully they are saying that let x be a random random variable and let p x equals to x denote the probability that x takes the value x all right we have seen this notation this is a fairly common notation now suppose that the point points by points they mean the points in the x y plane 2d coordinates x comma p of x equals to x or you can say x comma y for x equals to 0 1 2 3 4 lie on a fixed straight line in the x y plane and p of x equals to x equals to 0 for all the remaining values of x. So what we are going to assume is that uh, let that fixed line. They are saying you know, that these points lie in a fixed straight line. Let that fixed straight line equation be y equals to mx plus c. Where what is y? y is nothing but p of x equals to x. So if we put x equals to 0, my y will be equals to c, okay. Uh, this is nothing but p of x equals to 0. So let me write it as y, y not basically. Similarly, if when x is equals to 1, so y1 is equals to m plus c, x equals to 2, x equals to 3, x equals to 4. Let me call them y2, y3, y4. This will be 2m plus c. This will be 3m plus c and this will be 4m plus c. And these are my respective probabilities. You can say that these are nothing but probability of x equals to x also. So I got the probability distribution table x versus px. And you know that these are 5 mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. That means some of their probabilities must be equal to 0. So my c plus m plus c plus plus 2m plus c plus 3m plus c and finally plus 
4n plus c equals to 1. So a simplified equation would be 5 times c plus 4 plus 3, 7 plus 3, 10. So 10 times m plus 5 times c equals to 1 equation number. Next data that is given is the mean of x is 5 by 2, then what is the variance? And if variance is alpha, then 24 alpha. Now what will be mean? The formula to calculate mean would be, it is also denoted as expectation of the variable x, or sometimes mu also. This is nothing but sigma xi times p of uh, xi. Let me write it as p of i, probability of happening of this event. Okay, so this will be nothing but xi is 0 times its probability c plus uh, 1 times m plus c plus 2 times 2m plus c plus 3 times 3m plus c and plus 4 times 4m plus c. This mean is given as 5 by 2. So the next equation in m and c is c is how much? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 that is 10 times c and m is how many times? 1 is square plus 2 is square plus 3 is square plus 4 is square. 4 is square is 16. 16 plus 9, 25, 25 plus 5 is 30. So 30m plus 10c is equals to 5 by 2. So let me do one thing, let me multiply equation 1 by 2. So it will become 20m plus 10c equals to 2. And if I subtract these two equations now, uh, 2 minus 3, I will get 30 minus 20, that is 10m is equals to half. So my m will be equals to 1 by 20. And if I substitute that anywhere, my C will turn out to be, well, uh, if I put it in equation number 1, I will get 1 by 2 plus 5C equals to 1. So C equals to 1 by 2. So I now know the full probability distribution table, which I can use to find the value of variance. So the formula for variance would be, it is usually denoted as VAR of x. This will be sigma x i whole square times p of i minus mean the whole square. Okay, this will be the formula of variance. If you remember from statistics, the formula for variance uh, of uh, data set x i was sigma x i square uh, or rather sigma f i x i square upon n minus mean the whole square. So we are uh, replicating the same formula but this time for variance. Alright, another formula would have been ugly where uh, sigma pi times xi minus x bar the whole square. We don't want to apply that. Okay. So let us start putting these values. So what we have is xi square that is 0 square times probability c, c is how much? 1 by 10 plus, let me do one thing, let me calculate it in terms of m and c and then I will finally simplify m and c. So 0 square times whatever we don't care though it is c plus 1 square times m plus c plus 2 square times 2m plus c plus 3 square times 3m plus c plus 4 square times 4m plus c minus 5 by 2 the whole square. That is my complete variance. Alright then, let's calculate it. This is 0, this is Directly, 1 is 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube plus 4 cube times n. So this is 4, 4 is 16, 16, 4 is 64, 64 plus 27. Let me write it. 1 plus 8 plus 27 plus 64 times m plus, this is 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square plus 4 square times c. That turns out to be 30. So plus 30 times c minus 25 by 4. So if we calculate it, what we have is 8 plus 1, 9, 27 plus 9 is 36, 64 plus 36 is 100. So we have 100 times m, which is 1 by 20 plus 30 times c, which is 1 by 10, minus 25 by 4. So my variance turns out to be 5 plus 3 minus 25 by 4. So 5 plus 3 is 8 minus 25 by 4. So 32 minus 25 is how much? Uh, 7 by 4. If alpha is 7 by 4, which is variance, then this 24 times 7 by 4 will be 4, 6, 24 and 7, 6, 42. 
So the answer to this question is 42. All right, moving on. The next question are match the column type questions. And in a lot of such questions, you practically don't have to solve the full problem. What is the trick is that you start with the options. You analyze the options and which of these options look the most different. So you see this has 5, 1, 3, this is 2, 4, 5. So if we, and this is also 4, 2, 1, this is 1, 5, 4. So if I choose any of few of these and solve them, then you will get the answer. So that is the objective approach. Uh, but let me discuss the full solution because I have full faith that you guys are smart enough because you are taking the G-Advanced exam that you will be able to apply the objective approach. My aim is that no stone is left unturned in order to solve any of the parts. So I'm going to give you the detailed solution with respect to that. So basically, uh, let us read the data. Alpha, beta, district roots of this equation. Let me solve this equation also actually. So the solution of this equation would be uh, x is equals to minus 1 plus minus root of 5 divided by 2. So one of the roots is that is suppose arbitrarily alpha is minus 1 plus root 5 by 2 and beta is suppose minus 1 minus root 5 by 2. And uh, uh, another thing to observe about this is what is the sum of roots? My sum of roots alpha plus beta equals to minus 1. And what is product of root? Alpha beta is also equals to minus 1. So whenever we will need them, we will use them. Alright, now set T is 1 alpha beta where alpha beta roots of this equation. For a 3 by 3 matrix M A I J, define R I as sum of elements in a row and C I J as sum of elements in Jth column, I th row, Jth column. Alright, now we have to start looking at the options P. Option number P is number of matrices M A I J with all the entries in T such that sum of all the rows is 0 as well as all the columns is 0. So let me begin with the first row and in the first row we know that alpha plus beta is minus 1 so alpha plus beta plus 1 equals to 0. So the only way in which I can make the sum of a row or a column is 0 is if one of the element is 1, 1 is alpha and 1 is beta if all of the elements belong to this set. So without loss of generality let me write 1 alpha beta but how many permutations will be there of these three numbers? 3 factorial. So the first row can arbitrarily be filled in 3 factorial or 6 number of rows. But related to the first row, in how many ways can we fill the second row? Uh, either because I want to maintain the sum as 0, here either I can have alpha, uh, beta 1 and automatically the remaining elements will be beta 1 and alpha. Another choice was I keep the first row the same, 1 alpha beta. But rather than starting with alpha, I start with beta. So we have beta, then 1, then alpha. And it is automatically the third row will become alpha, beta 1. So for each of these three factorial ways, there are two ways of filling them internally. So overall, how many uh, do we have? Three factorials times two, that is three to the six, six to the 12. Okay, there are 12 such matrices. So answer of P is two. So answer has to be from option number B and C. Now for Q, option number B and C are the same. For S also, B and C are the same. So which option should we go to next? Ideally, we should go to option number R. That is the objective approach. So let me quickly get the answer and then I'll explain the remaining parts. So without wasting any time, let me discuss option number R. Let M be a skew symmetric matrix such that EIJ belongs to A for I is greater than G. So which are such elements for which I is greater than G? Uh, A21, A31 and A32, these three elements. Rest for a skew symmetric matrix, uh, this uh, diagonal elements will be zero. And whatever are these three, three elements, the above elements would be minus of those. Now what do we want to maintain? What do we want to maintain is that the number of elements in the set XYZ such so that XYZ belongs to R, M times XYZ equals to A12, 0 and minus A23. So uh, what we can do here is that uh, suppose we fill these three elements in any arbitrary way, suppose 1 alpha beta, then we know what will be the elements above this. Uh, another thing that we can do is, we can multiply this m with x, y, z and equate it to a12, a-2, 3 and z. Let me write these elements, this is a12, this is a13, a21, a22, a23 and a31, a32 and a33 which is 0. 
these are negative of each other negative of each other negative of each other so what do we have is a1 to n minus a23 so if i multiply this whole matrix with x y z what do i get i get 0 plus a12 times y plus a13 times z uh, and this is supposed to be a12 0 minus a23 Similarly, if I write the second equation, it will be something and third equation, it will be something. Now we have to find what is the number of elements in this set. For that, what are we supposed to do is we need to find the nature of this M. If we find the nature of this M, uh, then uh, this is zero because the determinant of skew symmetric matrix of odd order is always zero. This is a skew symmetric matrix of odd order. So the determinant will have to be zero. Next, let us find delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 or delta x, delta y, delta z, whatever you want to call it. So delta x, what do we do is we replace the first column with the right hand side a1, 2, 0 and minus a2, 3. So if I replace that a1, 2, 0 minus a2, 3, this is a1, 2, 0 and you know what is the relation between these two? a3, 2 is nothing but minus a2, 3. So I can here also write minus a2, 3. And the observation is first and second columns became identical. So this delta x held to be 0. If I find delta y, then nothing will change. Second column will be replaced with right hand side, which is practically the same as this column. So delta y is already zero because delta is zero. Uh, because delta y is same as delta. And what about delta z? For delta z, you will place third column with a12, 0 and minus a23, which is practically the same as second column. So again, delta z will also be zero. So if all the deltas are zero, that means it's a case of infinitely many solutions. So option number R is three infinitely many solutions. And this is in the oh, uh, option number C. So C is my correct answer. Though for the sake of completion of the question, in the exam time you can very much go with this strategy, should go with this strategy that need not solve all four, you need to save time. And that's a very good trick that the meso column questions they are giving in objective format so that you can do it in fast. Let us quickly do option number Q and R. What is Q? Number of symmetric matrices M with all entries in T such that sum of all the columns is zero. So for option number Q, let me start devising a matrix sum of all the columns is 0. So 1 alpha beta. But because this is symmetric, if this is alpha, this will also have to be alpha. If this is beta, this also has to be beta. Then what are the choices for these four elements? Basically, if this is uh, alpha and alpha, this cannot be uh, alpha. This can be either 1 or beta. So let me say in one of the cases it is 1. Then automatically it will become uh, beta but then that is not a good case because then or is that suppose if I put this as beta and if I just put as uh, alpha then it is not a good outcome uh, so what we needed to do was we must have put B beta over here so that here is one here is one and here is alpha so each of the element is occurring thrice and sum of all the three columns is one this is one of the ways of doing it is there any other way of doing it we arbitrarily wrote 1 alpha beta in the first column, right? Uh, we could have written any of the permutations. So again, it goes like that the first column can be filled in three factorial number of ways. And then uh, there are uh, how many other ways of filling the remaining columns? There is only one way, so it should be six. So what was the answer of option number C? For Q, it was number four, that is six, so yes, that is correct. That is what we expected because correct answer is already C. So 3 factorial into 1 that is 6 number of such matrices which satisfy the condition in Q. Now finally we have S left what is written in X. Uh, M be a matrix with all the entries in T such that sum of all the rows is 0 for all i. Then what is the absolute value of determinant of M? So suppose if sum of all the rows are 0 then what row operation shall we apply? Rather, we'll apply column operation that is C1 goes to C1 plus C2 plus C2. And whenever you do that, suppose we have these elements A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. If A plus B plus C is also 0, D plus C plus F is also 0, G plus H plus I is also 0. After applying this operation, first column will become 0, 0, 0. And whatever will be the second and third columns, this determinant will always be 0. So answer for option number S is 5, 0, which was already there in option number C. All right, moving on to the next question. Let the straight line y equals to 2h 
let your circle with center 0, alpha. Let us start by making the diagram. Okay, let us draw the line y equals to 2x roughly. Slope will be slightly steep. There is a circle touching this line y equals to 2x. Let us draw a circle as well. Whose so center is 0, alpha, so basically center lies at the positive y axis. Alright. Now, couple of things is that this touches the circle with center at 0, alpha. Center of the circle is 0, alpha. Uh, 0, alpha. Next is uh, radius is r. So, if I join this point of contact, this will be perpendicular also. This radius is r. And this point is known as A1. And B1 is the point which is diametrically opposite to A1. So if I extend this diameter, this is my point B1. Now this alpha, what is the relation between alpha and R? By the way, the slope of this line is 2. Uh, and suppose if this angle is theta, then this will be uh, 10 theta. And suppose my this angle is phi and these are complementary angles and you know what is 10 of pi by 2 minus phi it is cot phi. If cot phi is 2 then 10 phi will be half. So my 10 of phi is equals to half and if 10 phi is half then what will be relation between sin phi? Sin phi will be 1 by root phi. And by the way in terms of alpha and r, uh, this perpendicular is r and hypotenuse is alpha. So this will be r by alpha. So my alpha is actually r root 5 times. Now once I have this, I can substitute it here. So what I get is uh, r root 5 plus r is equals to, in the right hand side if I take root 5 common, root 5 plus 1 will remain. So my radius is root 5 and my alpha is root 5 times root 5 that is 5. So my alpha is how much? Root 5 r is, uh, sorry, r is root 5, alpha is 5. Alpha is 5, R is root 5. Uh, so 5 is which option number? Option number 4, root 5 is which option number? Option number 2. So 4, 2 is there in these two options, A and C. So in the remaining portions, you can just look at R and S. So if I look at R, what is the point A1? The point of contact A1. By the way, A1 lies on the line y equals to 2x, right? And you see there is only one point in the given options which lies on the line y equals to 2x which is 2 comma 4. So my r matches with 5. And you see among all the options r matches with 5 only in option number c. So answer is option number c. Basically you could solve this question without doing any much calculation. Just by observing option number r is simply lying on y equals to 2x. There is only one such option. So this question can practically be solved in less than 30 seconds or less than 1 minute. Though for the sake of completion, let us calculate each and everything. Let us calculate this point A1. Suppose its coordinates are alpha comma 12. And if it touches this circle, now we know that this radius is root 5 and alpha is 5. So distance of this point from the center will be equal to radius. So basically, distance of this point from the center will be uh, alpha is let us not assume alpha comma 2 alpha let us assume a comma 2 a all right i don't know this a but if i find a minus 0 whole square plus 2 a minus 5 the whole square this will be equals to root 5 the whole square so a square plus 4 a square minus 10 to the 20 a plus 25 is equals to 5 so what we have is 5 a square minus 20 a plus 20 equals to 0. So what we have is a square minus a plus 4 a plus 4 equals to 0. So there is only one value of a which satisfies this which is a equals to 2. So my point is 2 comma 4. That is totally proven now. And if 2 comma 4 is one of the endpoints, 0 comma 5 is the center, then for b1 and a1, 0 comma 5 will be the midpoint. So what will be the x coordinate of this? Minus 2 and what will be the y coordinate of this? 5. No, 5 is this, so 6. Minus 2 comma 6, which is option number 3. You can check all the options matches. Alright, moving on, next part is 16. Uh, L1 and L2 are these two lines which intersect at a point R1. So let us quickly find that point R1. Suppose this is my uh, lambda and this is my mu. 
So a point on the first line can be written as uh, lambda minus 11, 2 lambda minus 21 and 3 lambda minus 20. Similarly, a point on the second line can be obtained in terms of mu s. 3 mu minus 16 comma 2 mu minus 11 comma gamma mu minus 4. If I equate x coordinates, y coordinates, I'll get two equations in two variables, solve them and that's how I'll get gamma. So basically first equation will be lambda minus 11 is equals to 3 mu minus 16. So lambda minus 3 mu equals to minus 4 equation number. Similarly, if you equate the y coordinates, 2 lambda minus 21 is equals to 2 mu minus 11. So 2 lambda minus 2 mu equals to 10. So lambda minus mu equals to 5, number 2. If I subtract these, okay, suppose if I do 2 minus 1, then I'll get 2 mu equals to how much? Uh, 10, so mu equals to 5. If I put mu equals to 5 in any of these, I will get lambda as 10. Okay, if mu is 5, lambda is 10, what are the coordinates of the point are? Lambda is 10, then this is 10 minus 11 is minus 1, 20 minus 21 is again minus 1, and 30 minus 29 is 1. And my lambda uh, mu minus 4 will become equals to 1. Lambda is 10, so 10 mu minus 4 is equals to 1, so 10 mu equals to 5. Uh, by the way, so my mu is 5 by the way, not 10. So let me rectify myself. Uh, this is 1, mu is 5. So 5 gamma minus 4 is equals to 1. So my gamma will also be equals to 1. We got the value of gamma, mu and lambda and the coordinates of r. So gamma equals to how much? 1. Yes, p is option number 3. That is in 3 of the options. All right. Next, a possible choice for n cap. By the way, if we have this point minus 1, comma, minus 1, comma, 1, what will be the OR1 vector? Uh, minus i cap minus g cap plus k cap. So option number R is 1. P is 3, R is 1, and again in two options, option number A or option number C. Uh, now Q is same for all these three. So we must check for S. So let me quickly jump to S. But before that, we'll need to find n cap also. So basically n cap vector can be a unit vector. Now let me find the normal vector which will be the cross product of direction vectors of these two vectors which is i cap, j cap, k cap, 1, 2, 3 and because gamma is 1 I can write this as 3, 2, 1. So this is 2 minus 6 minus 4 i cap, j cap 1 minus 9 that is minus 8 but it will become plus 8 i cap and 2 minus 6 is again minus 4 k cap. So if you write in terms of its components, I take minus 4 common. So basically my normal vector is minus 4 times 1 comma minus 2 comma 1. Now if you divide by its magnitudes, then my n cap will become 1 by root 6, minus 2 by root 6, 1 by root 6. It can have either a plus sign or a minus sign. So out of these, the plus sign 1 is given in option number 4. So my q is option number 4. And s will be or vector dot n vector. It's dot with or vector which is minus 1 comma minus 1 comma 1 will turn out to be plus or minus well minus 1 by 6 plus 2 by root 6 and plus 1 by root 6 this gets cancelled what we have left with is 2 by root 6 plus or minus or this can also be written as root of 2 by 3 so this is my option number 5 so 3 4 1 5 3 4 1 5 is again option number 6 you see, so far in all the master column questions, the answer was option number C. Just a coincidence, so far let us see if that is true for the last question also. The last question is made unnecessarily complicated. fx is a function in two parts. x mod x sin 1 by x when x is non-zero and 0 when x is 0. And gx is a function uh, 1 minus 2x when 0, x lies between 0 and half and 0 otherwise. Then which of the following options is true? So if I look at some of the easy options, which one is the easiest by the way among these? I can see that, uh, see in all the options PQRS, only one of them is becoming non-zero, rest of all are zeros. In the first option, B is one, rest zero. In the option number Q, uh, A is one, rest are zero. In the option number uh, R, C is one, rest are zero. In option number S, D is one. 
Now, if I look at these functions, either this is simple or this is simple. So let me focus on these. Let me focus on the last one first. When d is one, rest are zero. So if you are solving for option number of s, my uh, h of x simply becomes g of x, which is simply one minus two x when x lies between zero and half, and zero otherwise. Now let us let us look at the options in list two. Is h one one not really? For all the other values of x, it is zero, so it is definitely many one. Is h n two not really? Its range will only lie when x is zero. This is one. When x is half, this is zero. So range will be from zero close to one closed. So option number four is two and two is false. Now there is only one option in which option number uh, s matches with four, and that is my option number c again. So you see, again, this question can be solved very very fast. If you go in the simple direction, but for the sake of completion, let us do the other parts. Okay, what if a is one and rest are zero? Then h x is simply f x. Now is f x a one one function? Not really. It will be zero several times uh, whenever x becomes one by n by. So this is not one one. Okay, uh, is f x on two? Will it take all the real numbers x? Again, I would like to say not really because whenever Uh, x is positive. Whenever x is x will go to positive infinity, this whole expression will also go to positive infinity side. And whenever x is negative infinity, then again this whole expression will go to positive infinity side. So it will uh, not take negative values, negative infinity value ever. So it is not on. Is it differentiable on all? Okay, let us look at four and five. Then is there in zero close to one closed? That is not true again because. For some large values of x, what will happen? This term will become ones, and it might go to plus infinity. So this is not true. This is not true. So answer for Q must be three. For R, it was. Uh, for S, it was four. For Q, it is three. Let us look at P and R. Uh, for Q, it is three. All right. P is when B is one. What is B? G of x plus G of half minus x. Let me define this by the way. We are attempting the option number uh, p, which says that b is one. That is, my h of x is equals to g of x plus g of half minus x, which if we divide into two parts, when x lies between half and zero, and when x is zero, then it will remain as zero, and whenever x lies between zero and half, then it will be one uh, minus two x plus One minus two times one by two minus x. This is one minus two x plus one minus one plus two x. So basically, uh, what all is happening is this is g of half minus x, right? G of half minus x will be this one two times half minus x. So 2x and 2x will get cancelled. One and minus one will get cancelled. Only one will remain. So is this function always identically equals to one? Let us see. Is it one one? No. Is it on two? No. Is it differentiable on R? Is it differentiable on R? Well, is that true? Uh, this will be one. Ah, uh, when now? This is multi-part, by the way. This will be one whenever x lies between zero and half. This will be zero otherwise. All right. So its range is zero and one. Its range con contains two elements. That is two. So for p, answer is five. And by the way, it's not differentiable at two point zero and half. Rest everywhere is differentiable, but not differentiable at zero and half. So none of the other options is true. Finally, if you solve number r. Here only c is one less than zero. So what is c? X minus g x. So my h of x will become x minus g x, which will be x minus one minus two x. That is three x minus one. Whenever x lies between zero and half, and this will be uh, x minus zero whenever uh, otherwise. All right. So if you plot this graph, by the way, let us first plot the graph between zero and half, and let us find the value at these endpoints. f of zero will be minus one. It's all right. And f of half will be three by two minus one. That is half. And rest the graph will be 
this and then this and then this. This is my fill. Now I can see that its range contains all real numbers, so it is an onto function. So for R, my option is uh, which one? Two. So we have five, three, two, four option number C. So that completes your paper. Overall, the difficulty is easy to moderate overall. And from J Advanced point of view, especially, it is really easy, historically easy, you might even say, because none of the previous five years paper was this easy, especially for math. Uh, similar, uh, uh, basically, uh, difficulty uh, criteria for physics and chemistry uh, can, of course, be discussed with respective teachers. Uh, stay tuned for such videos. Please subscribe to our channel, and uh, on the comments, you may write uh, which question explanation you like more and which type of video would you like to see next on our channel. All the best.